Okay, this is the first video for Chapter 12. In this one, we'll talk about doing hypothesis tests for a multinomial population for goodness of fit. So in all of Chapter 12, we'll be looking at categorical data. So we'll be separating it into different categories. And for this, we'll be using the chi-square distribution to get our critical values and to look at test statistics. In this video, we're going to talk about a goodness of fit test and that just uses a frequency table. In the next video, we'll talk about tests for independence, which uses a contingency table, which has two or more rows and columns in it. So when we do a goodness of fit test, what we're looking at is a specific distribution of the data, and we want to see whether it agrees or fits another claim distribution. When we do a hypothesis test for this, we we'll use the chi-square distribution. We'll look at the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies that we would get if the distribution is what we think it is. So and in this, we're doing a multinomial experiment. This is just like a binomial experiment, only it has more than two outcomes. So it has some of the same conditions that a binomial experiment did. That is, we have a fixed number of trials, the trials have to be independent, and all the outcomes have to be classified into exactly one of several different categories. So instead of just two possible outcomes, we might have five or six. And the probabilities for the different categories have to be the same for each trial. So here's an example. If someone asks you your weight, you may give them a number that's slightly lower than your actual weight, and you're likely to round it so you wouldn't say for example 128 pounds you might say 130 pounds or 125 pounds so if we have a sample that includes some weights how would we know whether they were actually obtained through measuring the weight or if they were just obtained by asking the subjects what their weight was so what we're going to do is take some data that came from the weights of 80 randomly selected students and see whether we think that those weights were actually measured weights or if they were just reported weights. If they were actually measured, the last digits should all have the same proportions. So they should be equally distributed between all 10 possible last digits. So if here's our actual data, you can see that already with the frequency table, that the 0 and the 5 as last digits have a lot more than the other digits. So this looks pretty likely that these weights were reported. But we're going to actually do a hypothesis test to make sure of that. So our four conditions of a multinomial experiment are that the number of trials has to be fixed. We had 80 different weights, so our number of trials is 80. The trials are independent because the answer for one doesn't depend on the answer for any other one. And each outcome, or each last digit, can be classified in, into exactly one of the categories. There are 10 different categories which are all the possible 10 digits from 0 to 9. And the last one is that if we're testing the claim that the 10 digits are equally likely, that means each possible digit has a probability of 1 tenth. The probability would be the same for each different subject. And here's our goodness of fit test. We're going to use it to test the hypothesis that our observed frequencies fit some claim distribution, in this case our multinomial distribution. Here's our notation. A big O represents observed frequency, a big E represents expected frequency, K is going to represent the number of different categories we have or the number of different outcomes, and N represents the total number of trials. So if all of our expected frequencies are equal, like they are in the example about the weights, then our expected frequency for each category is just the number of trials divided by the number of categories. If the expected frequencies are not all equal, then our expected frequency for each category is the number of trials times the probability for that particular category. So here are our requirements for a goodness of fit test. We have to have randomly selected data, and we have to have frequency counts for each of the different categories, not just percentages, but actual frequencies. And for each category, the expected frequency has to be at least five. Now this is the expected frequency, not the observed frequency. And when we find our test statistics, although we're not actually going to calculate this manually, this is how you would do it if you had to. For each category, you take the observed frequency minus the expected frequency, square that, and then divide it by the expected frequency. You do that for each category, and you'd add all that up, and that gives you your test statistic. And our critical values, if we're using the critical value method, 
then those come from the chi-squared distribution. And we're, for the chi-squared distribution, you have to use degrees of freedom, like we did with the t-distribution. There are going to be k minus 1 degrees of freedom. And remember, k was the number of categories. And goodness of fit tests are always right-tailed. And here's kind of the big picture about how this works. If the observed and the expected frequencies are in close agreement, then we'll end up with a small value for our test statistic, for our chi squared and our p-value will turn out to be large. If there's a large disagreement between our observed frequencies and our expected frequencies, then we'll get a large value of chi-squared and a small p-value. So if our test statistic value is large enough, we'll be rejecting the null hypothesis, which means that there will be support for the claim that the observed frequencies have, have a different distribution than the distribution we expected. Here's a diagram of how this test works. So we're going to compare our observed frequencies to our expected frequencies. If those two are, are for the most part, close together, then we get a small value of chi-squared and a large p-value. Then our conclusion will be that we fail to reject our null hypothesis, which means that our observed frequencies are a good fit with whatever distribution we're assuming. On the other hand, if the observed and the expected frequencies are far apart, then we get a large chi-squared value and a small p-value, which means we reject the null hypothesis, which means our observed frequencies are not a good fit with the distribution that we were assuming. All right, so we're actually going to conduct this hypothesis test. So here again are our, the last digits of our weights in the frequency table. And our null hypothesis is that, is that the proportions for each category are equal. So if we have 10 categories, that means the proportion for each one is 1 tenth. Our alternative hypothesis will be that at least one of the probabilities is different from the others. For this one, we're going to use an alpha of 0 0.05. And since we have 10 categories, that means our k is 10. So k minus 1 is our degrees of freedom. So that will be 9. And I'm going to show you how to do this using stat crunch because this is very time consuming to do this by hand. So here is that same table in StatCrunch and notice that I just entered the categories here and the observed frequencies here and then this third column is the expected frequencies. And remember we had 80 different weights here so if they're all equally likely then we would divide that 80 by the 10 categories, so the expected frequency for each category would be 8. Now to conduct this hypothesis test with StatCrunch, we're going to click the Stat button and go down to Goodness of Fit, and we're doing a chi-square test. And all this is going to ask us to do is tell the column where we have the observed frequencies and the column where we have the expected frequencies. And that's all we have to do for this, and then we can click on Calculate, and this gives us the number of trials, which was 80, the degrees of freedom, which was 9, and where it says chi-square, that's our test statistic, and our p-value, notice, is less than 0 .0001. So in this case, we have a large test statistic and a small p-value. And here is also our critical value, if we wanted to use the critical value method, and I'm going to show you how to do this also in StatCrunch. So if you want to find your critical value using StatCrunch, then you click on Stat, go down here to Calculators, and click on Chi-Square. This shows you what the chi-square distribution looks like, and you have to put in your degrees of freedom here, and we want to put in the probability. Remember, this is a right-tailed test, so we just put our alpha in here, and then we want to change this, since it's a right-tailed test, we want to change this to a greater than or equal to. And that will automatically give us our critical value, and it will draw the picture. So anything where this is shaded in red is our rejection region. And remember, our test statistic turned out to be very large. It was very much larger than the 16.9 that we got for the critical value. So that means it is in the rejection region. And here's a little table that shows how you would calculate your test statistic by hand. I'm not going to expect you to do this, but this is what you would do. You would find, in each category, you'd find the difference between the observed and the expected frequencies. You'd square that, and then you'd divide that by the expected frequency. And then you add up that last column, and that gives you your test statistic. But from the stat crunch results we had, our test statistic was 156.5, and our p-value was less than 0 .0001. And we did find our critical value was 16.919. Since our test statistic is much larger than that, we would reject the null hypothesis. We could also think about this with the p-value method since our p-value is so small, 
is smaller than alpha, which was 0 0.05. So that would also tell us to reject our null hypothesis. And that means there's sufficient evidence to support the claim that the last digits don't occur with the same relative frequency. So they're not all occurring with an equal distribution. And that would tell us, as we suspected, that the weights were reported instead of actually measured. Here's another example. And this is one where our expected frequencies aren't all equal. And this, this is called Benford's Law that if we look at leading digits, these are the frequencies that tend to occur. So this can be used to detect fraud because in this example, we looked at 784 checks from a company and looked at the leading digits in the checks and noticed that our expected frequencies and our observed frequencies are much, much different. And especially notice the five in the observed frequencies had a much higher frequency than we would expect. And again, that could mean that someone was writing checks for, say, $500 or $5,000. That would be fairly likely if there was some kind of fraud going on. So the claim is that there's a significant discrepancy between the leading digits that we expected from Benford's Law and the leading digits that we actually got from the 784 check. So here are the different probabilities from Benford's Law. So this is what we would expect to see if there was no fraud. And our alternative hypothesis is that at least one of the proportions is different from the claimed values that we had up here. We're going to test this with an alpha of 0 0.01. And since in this case we only have nine different categories, then our degrees of freedom is going to be eight. So again, we're going to use StatCrunch to look at this. So here we are in StatCrunch, and I just entered the information that we have into three different columns in StatCrunch. So I have the leading digits in the first column, the observed frequencies from the 784 checks here, and then the expected frequencies in this third column. The way you get the expected frequencies again is to take the total number of trials, in this case 784, and in this case multiply it by the expected probability for that category. Now to conduct our test, Again, we're doing a goodness of fit test, and we just put in our observed column and our expected column, and click on calculate. And notice how big, in this case, our test statistic is, 3,650. And again, our p-value is less than 0 .0001, so it's very small. If we wanted to use StatCrunch to find our critical value, then again, we'd go down here to calculators, do chi-square. Our degrees of freedom in this case was 8, and our alpha was 0 .01, so we would enter that there and then change this to a greater than or equal to. That means our critical value is 20.09. So here's our rejection region in the red. So there's our critical value that we just found, and our test statistic is much, much bigger than our critical value. And again, we could also look at the p-value and compare it to our alpha. The p-value is much smaller than alpha. So either way, we would get a conclusion of rejecting the null hypothesis, which means, again, that there's sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis, which means that at least one of the proportions is different than expected. So that would tell us that, that there's a good chance that there was fraud in this case. And here's a graph that compares our expected proportions with the observed proportions of those leading digits. For the 5 as a leading digit, notice how far the observed proportion is from the expected proportion.